Well, big hand to Karen. Uh, that's a tough act to follow. I hope he didn't scare you too much. I'm the guy who comes here to tell you that eating your vegetables is actually good for you. And <laughs> that is a difficult pitch. My name is Javier, and I'm a Spanish civil servant. I am the co-leader of the technical team advising our permanent representatives uh, in Brussels. I will first dedicate a few minutes to explain the Byzantine intricacies of how the, the legislative process is going. So we are under the Spanish presidency, presidency of the Commission. That means that the permanent representatives of Spain uh, have a, a function of a secretariat, of a owner's broker. They represent the whole council. Uh, in this part of the legislative process, there are three key players. There is the council representing the member states, which has uh, the democratic le uh, le representative, uh, uh, the legitimacy of the member states. There is the European Parliament, which has the democratic uh, legitimacy of uh, the votes of the people. And there is the European Commission, which has an advisory role and proposes the laws. The European Commission proposes a law, and both the European Parliament and the Council, the member states, um, draft different uh, text proposals. They have different mandates. Then they both uh, sit together and um, uh, hammer out uh, a common text, which is then voted in, in the Parliament. We are now in that process. Uh, that process uh, consists of, of several readings, but uh, the readings were a very cumbersome tool, so they invented the trilogues, the, which are a more flexible tool, but the, the trilogues weren't flexible enough, so they invented the informal technical meetings, and uh, those we have uh, almost every day. So, uh, in the position, in the point we are now, we have uh, the mandate of the Council, the mandate of the European Parliament, and the different proposals that come up, that are confidential, although they are leaked sometimes. <laughs> uh, what Kieran has explained to you right now is uh, the product of a leak. Uh, I will refer to it because it's out there, but I cannot uh, tell you what is going to be said today or what was said tomorrow. So. Uh, well, re recital 10 of the CRA uh, is the one that states whether you are inside the scope or you are outside of the scope. In the mandate of the COREPER, the Commission of uh, Permanent Representatives, uh, the Council means, uh, they had uh, well, the, the exclusion of non-commercial entities. You have to not monetize at all. Uh, they speak about uh, indications of commercial activity because there are some non-profits out there that are very lucrative. <laughs> that uh, sometimes they ch charge a price, that sometimes they charge for tech support, and they monetize in many creative ways. And, uh, and they also take into account uh, the circumstances of development of, of financing. The European Parliament also thought of uh, other forms of monetization, such as recurring donations by commercial entities, or indications like uh, having a single entity generating revenue, or the, the fact that all the contributors to a certain open source project just happen to work for the same company. And now, well, there we have some possible additions that are being uh, put out there, uh, taking into account the uh, open source software, like, uh, well, the, it's a unique nature of uh, being collaborative and the role of the stewards that I will uh, uh, point to in the, in the future. I want to make a stop here and uh, insist the CRA has a reason for existing. It is very important. Uh, we are not in the 90s anymore. The computer uh, at home, which uh, could have a virus, is now connected to your wearables. It's connected to the wearables of others. It's connected, therefore, to the network of your employer. It's connected uh, to the um, whole value chain of the, uh, of the employer. And uh, each of these elements, each of these goods and services, can be a vector for uh, infection. And uh, we live in a pandemic of infections, a pandemic of ransomware and malware. And it's uh, creating uh, a lot of problems uh, for companies and for citizens. That's why the European Union has two big laws, one for goods and one for services. One is uh, the NIST directive, the Network and Information System directive for services. And the other one is the Cyber Resiliency Act for goods. As Kieran said, uh, we had the Red Directive, the Radio Equipment Directive, which ended up covering 
all the radio equipment, including Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, mobiles. In the end, uh, it covered uh, like uh, half the world of IoT. Now we have included uh, all the products that can be connected by cable and also software, because uh, software was indir indirectly in the Red Directive, but uh, it's a product too, and it's a vector for infection too. And, uh, and all these laws rest on a specific uh, imperfection of the market, which is that uh, uh, the, the incentives for the seller are not uh, to take into account wholly the, um, uh, the welfare of the value chains the seller is contributing to. Because, uh, what the hell, I have my, my li legal liability, but nothing more. So uh, and we want to create uh, a, better, a, be a better environment for the whole value chain. So uh, I have this uh, stupid picture here that I, I have tried to make a, 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 a basic taxonomy of what is open source software. Uh, I give my thanks to uh, Benjamin from the European Commission because this is based on a scheme by him. So as we have said, we have two criteria. One is the money. Uh, where does the money come from? Does it come from a single contributor, uh, Mr. Manibax here? Does it come from several contributors, each pitching in? Or is it the project not monetized at all? And also we have uh, how much uh, the, the, the axis of control, of collaboration. It can be, there can be a single vendor, a single shop, which would be compatible with the model for the new legislative fr framework. As you know, the new legislative framework uh, governs the whole CE markings and uh, governs uh, everything that is sold in the EU. If you buy a pharmaceutical product, it has a CE marking for pharmaceutical products. If you buy a toy, a children's toy, it has a CE marking for children's toys saying it's safe. If you, um, if you, buy, uh, if you buy a piece of uh, metal protection for a road, it has a CE marking too. Uh, well, you can have managed collaboration. Uh, the key word here is governance. Does your collaboration have a, some governance, have some, someone who is the captain? <laughs> and you can have total anarchy. You can have uh, non-managed uh, collaboration with no governance at all. And uh, that is how we envision uh, the, the playing field. Of course, the, the real world is far more gran granular than what a law can say. We know, but uh, we have done our best. So uh, the initial proposal of the commission was to include, uh, uh, not to include anything that is not monetized, of course, and not to include anything that had zero governance, but to, to include uh, within the scope of the CRA everything else. Of course, uh, this was uh, thought to be too much, because, uh, for example, in this part here would be things like uh, some parts of Red Fat, for example, because there's, and they have one responsible entity and one stop shop. The Linux kernel would be he around here because it is managed collaboration and it is paid for by contributors. But uh, um, I mean, we, we, ha we heard uh, bad opinions about this. And uh, we have also the, what is in the mandate of the Corepa, the council mandate, which is one of the two texts that are now to be, debate, uh, that are to be debated. So uh, within the scope is our only, in this text, uh, one single responsible entity and one single vendor. And in, in these fields around, you see some question marks here, uh, on a case-by-case -by -case basis, the market surveillance authority of each member state could say, yes, but in your case, you are to be included here because um, you have many contributors, but uh, you, are mo you look more like a one responsible entity because of your specific model. Or you have a, a managed collaboration, but it's so managed, so heavily managed that it looks like a single vendor. So it has good sides because uh, it lets, uh, and also the uh, cybersecurity pledges of the uh, of FOSS are part of this model. Uh, it has uh, its good sides and its bad sides. It, uh, this is all a trade-off. There's no model that is best uh, in, a, in a Goldilocks point where everyone is happy. Uh, when you buy advantages with disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is that uh, it is more unpredictable because uh, the market surveillance authority may make a decision in your case which you don't like. And uh, it's also uh, black or white. Either you have the full responsibilities of a uh, responsible entity of a, an NFL, NLF vendor or nothing. 
and it's very difficult to go from one point from one to the other. And then there is the Parliament mandate. Uh, the Parliament mandate was very broad. They wanted to include everything. Uh, but uh, what I've heard as of late, without going in too much in, uh, in the discussions, which are uh, confidential, is that uh, they have come around to lessening this a bit. And we have some possible image of a compromise which has been floated in the, what is called the October text, which has been leaked, that uh, will have uh, two figures. One figure would be of, of the NFL, NLF vendors, the manufacturers, the people who are putting their stuff out there on the market, and the others would be called stewards, for lack of a better word. These stewards wouldn't have a, a very light touch supervision regime. Their obligations wouldn't be very much because they are just intermediators. Their obligations would be to intermediate between the market surveillance authority and the pool of um, contributors from different, uh, uh, different places and, uh, uh, and the, the, the integrators. They would also uh, be a way, a, a step up between uh, not having anything and, uh, and having something uh, and uh, some stewards may, in due time, uh, come around to be uh, full NLF vendors if they, if they get, get to be successful enough. This, uh, um, this is uh, the spur compliance solution which I personally think would be best for several reasons. One of them is that, uh, well, uh, you, you, uh, in every sector, uh, companies come to us saying, we don't want supervision, leave us out. But being, it's cold out there. Uh, having a CE marking is a very good thing. Uh, uh, there's a reason why uh, the China puts uh, a China export symbol that looks very, very much like the CE marking. And that is that um, uh, if, if I'm a, a manufacturer of, of this remote and I have to integrate chips and software in it, I can have uh, two options. I, I can buy chips that have already a CE marking and I have n don't have to worry anymore. Or I can buy chips that do not have a CE marking and then I have to comply myself with all the duties of certification, of revision, of uh, managing them and, and notifying the vulnerabilities, etc. And if you are an open source provider and want your software to be used out there, um, you, uh, you will be astute. You, um, some producers are not going to choose you because um, you are too costly and besides it's, it's not a very manageable cost or a very predictable cost. Uh, the, the cost of an economic uh, um, vendor uh, is much more predictable. But through this model of stewards you, might, you may in a very lightweight way uh, comply with uh, these requisites and uh, have more market opportunities. And uh, that's what it is. I hope I could uh, tell you more, but uh, this is currently being negotiated over. And uh, I also uh, concur with Kieran. Um, I sincerely desire that we would have more time to have, give it our another go and revise a better comp a possible compromise. But uh, time is on us. The Spanish presidency ends very soon. And uh, after the EU uh, elections, the, all these negotiations would have to start from scratch. And um, the, the, uh, the parliament, both parliament and council, are very, very keen on getting this over with as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, we do have 10 minutes for questions. Oh, uh, uh, as many minutes as you like. As many minutes, probably 10. Uh, first question there. Hi, thank you so much. Is this working? Yeah. For this uh, interesting presentation, the, complication, the situation seems to be like quite complicated. And uh, after seeing all those matrices, uh, I'm wondering whether you have created any sort of taxonomy reflecting what would be the implications for uh, European businesses and for European citizens of all the different options there if open source is in some, how, in some way impacted by CRA according to the current text of the law. So, I don't know, is that's that a, information? That's a very good question and a very broad one too. So, uh, Kieran harped a lot on uh, the basic fear of most EU regulators which is let's not 
give the final killing blow to our industry. Let's not scare uh, producers away. But uh, frankly, cybersecurity is here to stay. Uh, cyber resilience will be required not only in the EU, because uh, uh, the problem I have uh, touched upon, the, the, re the rationale for the CRA is a real one. We live in a cybersecurity pandemic. And uh, you don't want to be the guy who says, no, no, no masks for me, <coughs> I'm asthmatic. Because you may get, get away with it, but uh, then you will not be making, making many friends and influencing people, and uh, you will not be commercially successful. So what will be the impact on businesses? Well, the thing is, uh, the good side of uh, this layer of regulations is that they impact all businesses, all software producers and all um, producers of goods shall have to comply with the CRA. Of course, we haven't touched this because the CRA is very broad. The, it, depending on the criticality of your product, you have, will have to comply with harsher requirements or with less harsh requirements. And like 90% of the products all the, out there shall make do with uh, presenting a self-evaluation. So it, in the end, it will not be so harsh. But will this kill off the European businesses? I think not, because uh, the, in the United States, this is going to be implemented, and uh, in, in China, in, uh, in other nations too, because uh, this is being demanded. It's being demanded by citizens. This is another part of the thing. Uh, we get a lot of pressure from, the, from industry lobbyists, from all kinds of, of manufacturers of equipment, uh, you may imagine, but uh, consumer defense uh, associations are m much less effective in, uh, in lobbying us. And uh, we want to listen to them too. And it's, uh, it's for the sake of the citizens that we do this and also for the sake of value chains. I mean, the harsher requisites and things like uh, machining tools and things that are used in critical value chains. Hello? Yeah. Um, so um, one of the questions that remains is that you said that, um, well, CRA is, of course, on the uh, EU side. And then China and the US are also working on their own CRAs, like um, laws. Um, how, is the, how is the parliament or how is the EU uh, trying? We live in a um, very broad and, and, and connected world, right? Um, mm -hmm. And most of the, at least of the open source software, comes from engineers all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, how would how would this apply to software that's maybe, uh, I don't know, started in the US and then continues in China? Um, and also, um, how, do, how do you plan to, not, not you of course, but the, the EU <laughs> stays competitive uh, in terms of productivity and software, whereas the other CRAs around the world might not be as restrictive as this one? That's a really very good question, thank you. Well, uh, as you have said, I am not planning, planning anything. I'm a small cog in the machine, a humble civil servant, but I'm inside of the machine, so I can see things. Uh, the CRA uh, applies to all kinds of goods. I mean, you see your own specific part of the box, but uh, it applies to all kinds of industrial goods. Uh, everything that can have a data connection. And in the modern world, that includes shoes. <laughs> So yes, that is the case in many places because value chains are um, all around the world. And uh, things are not made in Indonesia, are not made in China, not made in Europe. They are put together everywhere. So this is not only the case for software, this is the case for everything. And uh, the, um, I mean, the EU has a lot of experience in this because the new legislative framework substitutes the former legislative framework. And uh, this is uh, the whole, business case of the EU about uh, having a customs union and uh, having free transit along that customs union. What differences uh, does software have with all the, with physical goods? Well, for one, um, software is immaterial. So 
when you talk about physical goods, you talk about things that come in containers that arrive in a harbor and are down, um, uh, that, that are put into a train, and uh, they, they arrive to a very specific member state, and they're, they're, it's the member surveillance authority in that member state that guarantees the C marking or things that are fabricated in some member state and they are guaranteed the C marking. Uh, in a member state or in, for example, uh, or in other countries that have a, a customs union with the EU, like, as, in, as is Turkey, or in countries that uh, have a specific kind of um, a treaty of uh, mutual acceptance. Uh, he is looking at the United States and um, uh, where the, this is accepted. But in the end, uh, you have got a manufacturer, and, uh, and this manufacturer uh, puts together things, and, uh, and uh, as long as the things he manufactures are CE compliant and have a CE marking, and the things he buys are CE compliant and have a CE marking, he's okay. And if they don't, he's responsible for that part in software too. Um, the, um, a, good, a very good question is, uh, but what about uh, the physical presence? Where is the, sof the software sold? Well, uh, I personally wanted to, for the software of the CRA regulation uh, to be like the digital services in the NIST directive, which have the main establishment or main representative um, policy, which is if you, sell, if you sell digital services in the EU, you have to answer for, to the NIST authority to the Cyber Security Authority of the place where you have the, the main establishment. As things stand now, this is not the case here. If you sell in Spain software, you are, uh, you are going to answer to the Market Surveillance Authority in Spain. Of course, uh, pulling together the supervision uh, resources of uh, member states makes a lot of sense, and it makes more sense in, in, in software because uh, it's not people uh, standing at a specific harbor and uh, watching things come through. Uh, it's uh, more centralized. So, and there are already uh, initiatives by the European Commission, like the Cyber Solidarity Act, where they talk of pooling of resources, of putting together resources. So I see in the future uh, um, some, some future model coming of uh, unification uh, or pulling together of, the, of these supervision uh, actions by member states in the, for the sake of efficiency. Uh, but, of course, uh, EU legislation comes, uh, moves at a glacier pace. Look at, I mean, data protection. Data protection started in the 80s, and <laughs> now we have it, it's more or less ripe. So every six years, we will be getting a new CRA, as in every six years, we are getting a new NIST uh, directive iteration. And uh, this is one first shot. This is a parting, uh, the start shot. This, uh, they are sh they are in, in six years, they will, uh, we will uh, hopefully uh, see how this has been working and perfect it.